Good morning. I think we're about ready to go. Welcome to our forum. Welcome to our forum on the book of forgiving. I'm going to start this morning using part of a prayer from the book, and then I will jump right in. This um, is called the prayer before the prayer. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. I want to be willing to forgive, but I dare not ask for the will to forgive in case you give it to me, and I am not yet ready. I am not ready yet for my heart to soften. I am not ready yet to be vulnerable again, not ready yet to see that there is humanity in my tormentor's eyes, or that the one who hurt me may also have cried. I am not yet ready for the journey. I am not yet interested in the path. I am at the prayer before the prayer of forgiveness. Grant me the will to want to forgive. Grant it to me, not yet, but soon. Amen. This book of forgiving, um, I hope today will be helpful for you in this overview for your own relationships, but hopefully on a, on a larger trajectory, maybe it'll prompt for you some stirrings that'll help you as we approach our Lenten journey, ponder a bit something that you might decide you want to bring to our quiet day Lenten retreats, maybe bring up in some pastoral conversations with Oren or Elise or me. This book is full of tools prayers, meditations, writing prompts that you can use very personally in your own life. I'm not going to dive into those today. I will bring some of them to help us on our retreat, but today is more just a, an overview of the approach of the book itself. So it's an open invitation, a little taste today in the hopes that it's something that can continue for you in the coming weeks, months, lifetime. The book is co-authored by Desmond Tutu. Uh, I'm sure most, if not all of you, know Desmond Tutu by name, a human rights activist known for anti-apartheid, nonviolent resistance. He won the Nobel Peace Prize for that. He was an Anglican archbishop um, and a primate, um, Archbishop of Cape Town, chair later of South Africa's Truth and Reconciliation Commission, and was known throughout his life for his ongoing writing and speaking and working for peace. And he is funny, too. Like, this is somebody who's seen so much, and he's so funny. What a light. Um, and then Umpa, actually, that Umpa initiated the pastoral ministry with rape survivors in Grahamstown. Umpa is one of Desmond Tutu's daughters. She's an Episcopal priest, founding director of the Desmond and Leah Tutu Legacy Foundation. She also is an activist, an author, a pilgrimage leader. And um, right now, what her passion really is, is in speaking and art and preaching primarily on this work of forgiveness and for the well-being of girls. She's really focusing a lot of her efforts on the well-being of girls. So these are things you probably know, both Desmond and Impa Tutu, for what you may not know, and I'm sure they would put on their list of credentials, is that um, Desmond Tutu ordained me. <laughs> That's me in the front. And I got to work with Impa in our first position together at Christ Church in Alexandria. So I'm sure that would be on their list as they, as they talked about all the things that they have done. Um, maybe Impa really learned about forgiveness by the burden of working with me. I don't know. But anyway, Oren made me tell you. <laughs> so why this book? Well, the book of forgiving, Desmond Tutu says, was primarily born of an answer to a question he was often asked, which is, what did you learn when you were chair of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission? And from visiting all the places since where there's been terrible suffering and conflict, what have you learned? And he said, and underneath that, what he thinks is really there was sort of an unspoken question. Okay, what have you learned? How do people forgive? How do people do it? And then underneath that is, you know, how do I do it? And so this is a book for everybody who needs forgiveness, people who need to give forgiveness, people who need to receive forgiveness, maybe in some big, huge, terrible traumas, and maybe in some tiny daily grievances. So in other words, this is a book for everybody, all of us. This is what they say, the why of this book. The quality of human life on our planet is nothing more than the sum total of our daily interactions with one another. Each time we help and each time we harm, we have a dramatic impact on our world. Because we are human, some of our actions will go wrong. 
and then we will hurt, be hurt or both. It's the nature of being human, and it's unavoidable. Forgiveness is the way we set those interactions right. It's the way we mend tears in the social fabric. It's the way we stop our human community from unraveling. In other words, forgiveness is nothing less than the way we heal the world. So for all the work that particularly Desmond Tutu and Umpa are known for in, in facing the reality of the world, they're never claiming that we can get rid of hurt. Let's create a world where nobody hurts. That's not their claim. They say part of our human existence as frail, vulnerable, real, limited people in a context of everybody around us who's the same over generations, we will hurt people and we will get hurt. The issue isn't that we can avoid it. It's what do we do with it? And if we practice a way of forgiveness, it really can be healing to ourselves and then, as a consequence, to the world. So they say this is a, a primer only. It's not a book just to kind of read and say, now we get it, we've got the four you know, steps here. It's a practice. And so this book, they say, is an invitation into a fourfold path of a daily life of forgiving. And in the book, they lay out some key foundational principles that guide all their thinking in their writing, but also in their own work and living and in their personal lives. They tell amazing stories. This is the thing that to dive into the book itself, it's so accessible because they, they do a lot of research on forgiveness. And so they've come into contact with people in a variety of settings who can then tell stories. And some of the stories in the book are those horrendous things like a woman sent her, her uh, husband and daughter off to a conference and the, the hotel they were staying at was attacked by terrorists and the, the, her family was killed and she ended up being able to forgive the terrorists and work with them. You know, it's those kind of amazing stories. You, you think, how on earth did someone do it? And they also tell stories from their own lives, very personal stories. Desmond Tutu talking about his, his relationship with his father. Umpa Tutu, her family experienced a terribly violent crime in their home. And so they draw on a whole range of stories to bring to life what it is they're talking about. And then they provide prayers before each of the, the steps, just like I, I read to you. And they also offer some things like guided meditations, physical rituals, because we carry so much of our hurt in our body, even when we're not aware that we do. So there's physical rituals in the book to help us unlock some of that, and fantastic prompts for journaling. So I do commend the book to you to use on your own. And like I said, I'll bring some of those pieces into our retreat. Um, I can't get into all those today because it's really a, a lived experience of being in the work of the book. Okay, but the underlying assumptions I can definitely bring to you today. So here's where they're coming from. Again, there seems to be no end to the ways that humans can hurt one another. Desmond Tutu says, I have seen so much and there always seems to be something even worse. There seems to also, though, be no end to the innate human ability to bring joy from suffering and hope in healing. So we have the two sides of that same coin. They are adamant that there is nothing that cannot be forgiven. And that they are adamant that there is no one who is undeserving of forgiveness. This is a huge premise of the book. No one undeserving. Hurt comes from brokenness. Forgiveness is a journey to wholeness. And everybody's on it. Our fundamental nature is goodness. They have another book they wrote together that's also really good. It's called Made for Goodness. So they claim our fundamental nature is goodness. And our fundamental nature is relationship. So we can feel it when things aren't right. We know. We might feel like we're in the right when we're holding on to grievances and griefs, whether it's really personal ones or looking out at the world. But deep down, we know that that's not the way we're supposed to be in terms of our relationship. We know that we're not supposed to feel so disconnected and out of sync. It, they draw really on the South African understanding of Ubuntu, which is a, it's a hard word to translate, says Desmond Tutu, but it, it really is an understanding of humanity that is completely mutual and reciprocal and interdependent. I am because you are. If there wasn't a you, there really wouldn't be a me. I am because we are. We are human because we are human. Our dignity is bound up in each other's dignity and our freedom is bound up in each other's freedom. So what harms you harms me and any tear has an impact 
for the whole, and so therefore any tear must be mended for us all to be whole. All of it's bundled up, interconnections, inner causality. It's complex. None of us stands alone in it. So when we begin to see this, it allows for a compassion for perpetrators, for ourselves, in this work of recognizing our brokenness and stepping towards wholeness. Shared humanity is actually the basis for the possibility of forgiveness. So they, they write this book particularly to be non-sectarian. They claim that they come from a, a Christian faith perspective, and it's their faith and their understanding of God who helped them forgive. But they wrote this book so that anybody, religious, non-religious, different uh, uh, strains of different faiths, could use this. So they really are clear that the shared humanity is the basis, not sort of our commandment from God. Ubuntu is my humanity is caught up in yours. So now they say, why forgive? And the answer may not be what you would think. Forgiveness is a gift to ourselves. That's a huge premise of the book. Forgiveness is a gift to ourselves. I want to pause here and I'm going to invite you to think about something in the past week, or if not the past week, maybe something will come to you because you know you carry it. Some kind of thing that's gotten under your skin. Think of something that, where you're carrying a bit of a grudge or a grievance or a conflict. It could be something about a group of people and what they're doing, you know, like all those Democrats or all those Republicans or all those Maryland drivers, right? Tucker, the Maryland driver, right? It could be a group and it's just kind of a general sense that what they're doing is just getting under your skin, right? Or it could be something really personal, something somebody said to you or a way somebody dismissed you. Could have happened this morning just trying to get ready for church or out the door. Think of something and notice what your body does. Do you kind of feel yourself like tense up a little bit or get a little bit rigid? Like you're, maybe your breathing changes. We know intuitively that when we're holding on to things that, that, need, that are broken and need that work of forgiveness, we can feel it in our body. We know that intuitively, but studies even show it affects our physical well-being as well as our emotional and spiritual well-being when we are broken and when we're carrying grudges. Forgiveness is the best form of self-interest. Whereas on the contrary, there are harmful effects in our lives for things like resentment and isolation. So they talk about studies outside of the religious world that, that say how, how forgiveness harms us. I mean, how, not, not forgiveness harms us and forgiveness you know, itself can actually be healing on um, physical, emotional, and spiritual levels. We also get a freedom in forgiveness. I mean, we want to be agents of our own lives, right? But when we are tethered to a grievance, tethered to a hurt, we're kind of tethered to a person who harmed us. They have power in our life. The past has power in our life. It has more power than we even sometimes acknowledge. That's what's shaping and driving us. So if we can forgive, we get freedom for our own life. We can reclaim our life as our own. We're informed, not defined by our past, but by the present and the future that we want. And we see greater health in all relationships. If, we're, if our health is better because we give ourselves the gift of forgiveness, it affects all the ways that we are interconnected with each other and even affects people across generations. This is why they say with such, such conviction that it's what we need to heal the world because we carry this grievance and trauma and hurt so deeply and over so much time. And they say we do it not for others. We don't even do it for God. There's that thing again. They say other people and God help us. But we do it for ourselves. And that premise surprised me. But they carry that through the whole book. So also it's really helpful to be thinking about what forgiveness is and what it isn't. So it's not dependent on the action of others. Now, I'll say more later about what happens to the relationship. There may be some things that are connected to the actions of others, but forgiveness itself isn't dependent on anybody else. Well, I'll forgive her if she'll just admit that she, right? <laughs> You're still tethered to that other person. You know, once they call me, if they call, I'll be fine if they call me, but until they call me, I am not, I am not right? So that's conditional. That's still completely giving them all the power. 
Forgiveness is unconditional. There's no strings. I forgive you because I forgive you because I forgive you because I want to. So there. (laughs) Um, Forgiveness, unconditional. It's not a luxury. It's not an extra. Harms and abuses really do need to be faced truthfully. It's not forgetting. There's, um, there's a lot of great podcasts and interviews when you can see Umpa and Desmond being interviewed about this book back, um, back in about 2014. And uh, they'll ask questions. And one woman, I think it was Ann Curry, said to, to Umpa, well, when you forgive someone, do you forget what they do? And Umpa went, oh, no. <laughs> it's not forgetting. You, 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 you know the, the hurt needs to be named. And it's not a weakness because there's a lot of strength in the vulnerability and the humility to do this. It's not that the weaker person acquiesces and forgets. It's a strength to be that person who can claim the present and the future. It's not a a subversion of justice. So forgiveness doesn't relieve people of consequences of their actions. Sometimes we're hesitant to see forgiveness happen, um, but, but it is not the same thing as no consequences. And it's simple, but it's not easy. And it is completely our choice. Every single person has the capacity to forgive. In one of those interviews, I think it was also the Ann Curry one, Ann Curry told one of the horrendous stories that's in the book and said to Desmond Tutu, how did they have the capacity to do that? Was they just an extraordinary person? And Desmond Tutu and Impa Tutu said, they are extraordinary people who did that. And every single person can be an extraordinary person. Desmond Tutu said, the the same terrible thing can happen to you. Your child could be killed by a drunk driver. Your family could be taken in a terrible terrorist attack. You might surprise yourself with your capacity to forgive. So there's real hope in our capacity as people. And he says, in fact, that's why you can't write anybody off as a monster. He, he wrote a really controversial um, editorial at one point when he defended somebody who had done a heinous act and people were saying, he's just a monster, there's no hope. He said, that lets him off the hook. He's a human, so he's accountable. We don't give monsters a chance. We expect humans to have the capacity to be whole. So it's, it's a kind of tough love, very hopeful, but very much because there's accountability and strength, not um, weakness and subversion. So here it is really a choice. Um, Umpa said this is probably the only thing that her dad can draw. <laughs> Circles. Um, we get hurt, we have harms, we have losses, that box right there in the middle, we, we've said before, it's inevitable, that will happen. So our choices in how we respond Often we find ourselves knowingly or unknowingly in that that left side, the revenge cycle, where we are hurt and harmed and we have loss and we feel pain and we don't like that. So we've got to find a way to get rid of the pain. We've got to get that off of us and we tend to do that by getting it onto other people. I'm going to get that out there. And so we either choose to harm and retaliate, get our payback. We say the nasty thing. You're going to cut me down. I can be even slice you back with a meaner word than what you just said, right? We have some of those things in our back pocket ready to go. Um, That's why sometimes we end up in the same bickering over and over. We're ready to pull out the knives. And sometimes that comes out in the relationship where the harm has happened, but it also comes out other places that same violence and cruelty and kind of same action of inflicting pain, it comes out in other relationships. And pretty soon everybody's getting hurt and we're all doing this cycle and it just snowballs. So at that moment of hurt and harm and loss, when we feel the pain, there's the moment. There's the moment. And the strength comes in the thing that we don't like to do, which is in sitting with the pain. So again, forgiveness isn't about us being placid people who don't feel bad. It's not that I'm forgiving because I don't feel the same stuff. I'm just willing to actually feel it and be in the pain. To recognize what's happening. To own what's going on with me. And then to choose to heal. And that's when these next steps of the fourfold journey come in. So again, sometimes we think, oh, forgiving people must have this capacity to let kind of things just roll off them. It actually is coming from the ability to acknowledge the pain, the hurt, the vulnerability, 
and to say, yeah, I'm a weak, limited person, and I feel bad. That got to me. So what am I going to do with it? So they say if you practice this fourfold path in small ways, if one of those big hurts happens, you're more ready to deal with it. So the first part is telling the story. It is important when we are preparing to forgive. This doesn't mean we're ready yet. We recognize we've had a hurt in our lives. We recognize someone has wounded us. The, wound, the same sensors are triggered, by the way, for physical wounding as emotional wounding. It is a wound. We physically hurt. Same, same sensors. So the first thing that has to happen is we have to name the story. I actually admit it happened. And to do this... You just start with what you know. Just start with the facts. And a few different things can happen here. The example um, that they give is actually the, the violent crime that happened to Umpa. Her housekeeper, who lived with them like a member of the family, was murdered during a burglary in her house. And she got home to find this person had been killed in her young daughter's bedroom. Totally traumatizing. And so at first... Um, all she could do was just kind of repeat. You know when you've been in a trauma and you find yourself telling the same part of it over? And she just had to say, I went out and I knew something was wrong because I couldn't get in touch with her and I came home. The house was too dark. It didn't feel right. I walked through the... She had to tell that story over and over and over. And when we tell the story of something that's happened to us, um, our implicit memories that we carry and those ex explicit memories that we recognize, they can be more integrated. And it's a first step to us to start to make meaning of what we experienced. Otherwise, we stuff it away and it becomes part of our kind of um, disowned past, but we are not really dealing with it and we get this disconnect in our experience. And sometimes when people really get to places of, of real depression and, and struggle, mental illness, sometimes it's really this big disconnect between what we acknowledge and what we've held onto in the past. It's really important to know our story. It builds resilience. They talk about studies that show that, that children who know the story of their family, their history, all that, they can be more resilient when dealing with a crisis when it comes up. Um, it needs the truth. Can't pretend it didn't happen. Uh, even Jesus, post-resurrection, shows the scars. Right? We're ready to move forward. At the same time, we've got to show the scars first. So you just kind of start with the facts and the technical details. It's important when you want to do this to decide who you're going to tell the story to. The first time you tell it probably isn't going to be to the person who hurt you. Might be, depending on the relationship. But the first time you tell the story may be that you've chosen a different family member or friend, someone you trust, maybe a professional, maybe a clergy person or a counselor. So depending on the story and where, what it has, its impact has been in your life, or if you don't know what the impact has been, choosing that first person to tell is really key. You can write it down. You can, you, there's all kinds of different things that you can do. And then maybe eventually you're going to go approach the person with whom you are now in some kind of disharmony. But that may not be your first go-round. The next part of the story is not just the story itself. It's, it's going a little bit deeper. It's naming the hurt. So, and I know this in my life. There's been times when I've been really hurt and I get stuck in the story itself. Like I'm looping the story and my friends are tired of going to coffee with me because I'm telling the same story and I'm telling it in my head. And I'm going, like you can get kind of stuck in the story. The next step is to say, okay, the story is going to unfold as I understand better what's happened, but identify what it means for me. Start going from the, 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 the facts of just what happened to the feeling in the facts. Face the feelings, the depth of the pain. You can't let go of what you don't own. And no feeling is wrong or bad or invalid. So again, it's, a, it's a, as real of a wound as a physical wound. If we ignore the feelings of what happened to us as a result of that story, they come out somewhere else. They come out in our interactions. They come out in self-harm, the ways we sabotage ourselves, the way we numb ourselves. There's all kinds of ways that what we don't want to feel still comes out when we don't deal with it. So if we can name the hurt, this happened, I came home, like Mpa, I came home, I found our, I was, I was so sad, I was so angry, 
How could somebody take away our sense of safety? How could somebody take away this beloved person from our lives? I was grieving, I was furious, I was vulnerable, right? All of that, naming what happened. It actually goes along with the stages of grief. Think about Kubler-Ross and the stages of grief. You have denial, and you have anger, you have depression. Eventually, you get to acceptance. But naming the hurt can help us, when we're ready, to move out of the denial part so we can move towards the acceptance part and everything in between. So sometimes we need to relearn how to feel. Um, and that is that sometimes we have learned to stuff those, those negative, difficult feelings. Um, and it can help to note what's in our body. So if you, you may find that if you are feeling like you're always tight in your chest, or you go through a season of life and it always feels like there's some kind of tears behind your eyes, or you're having like issues with your stomach, sometimes it's there's an unresolved pain. And so we can sometimes have to relearn how to feel and build up a vocabulary for our pain. And again, the hurt is inevitable, but naming accepts that and helps us move forward quicker. Um, so when you are doing this, you want to find someone who can listen and acknowledge those feelings without trying to fix them or fix you. So you're telling your story, but you also don't want someone just to say, oh, you're okay. I'll tell you, in my family growing up, I don't think my parents meant it this way. But in their desire to comfort me, what they would often say when I was feeling something was, oh, don't be silly, it's okay. What did I hear? Your feelings are silly. Right? It's not what they meant. I mean, they didn't, it was meant to be caring. But so, you know, in our family, it wasn't a lot of comfort staying with the, the feeling. You wanted to move to being okay. So, so they would say, you don't have to move quicker than you're ready. The, the feelings are not silly. The hurt is real. And to actually move through it, being able to name it is super, super important. When we're ready, we get to the place where we grant forgiveness, and that's the choice. That's why I've got this person of someone holding a rock. Are they going to hold on to it? Are they going to put it down? Granting forgiveness is a choice that happens as quickly or as slowly as it needs to. Sometimes we do this so fast we've barely noticed. He tells a story about, you know, his kids knocked over a, a vase that was really important to him because it belonged to his grandma, and, and he was, and then he just swept it up, and he was like, it's okay. Like, he went through the whole cycle like that. But other times, you it takes years. Um, Umpa says that for all those great big stories of hurt in the book, she thinks the hardest one is when somebody just that you trust betrays you. So maybe those great big things about a driver or a terrorist, they're horrendous. But that person with whom you had a mutual agreement somehow violates what you thought was your mutual agreement, that can be the very hardest thing to forgive. But when we get to this point, we're not condoning the past, we're not agreeing with it, we're not saying it was okay, we're recognizing that it can't be changed. What happened, happened. But we go from being a victim to being a hero. We can determine our own fate. Um, we have the strength to be generous. We recognize that the context is our shared humanity. So all that hurt I allowed myself to feel and the vulnerability that I allowed myself to acknowledge actually becomes that bridge to help me remember that the person I'm looking at who hurt me has the same hurts and vulnerabilities. So it kind of levels that playing field, that Ubuntu, that common humanity. And then we can go forward and tell a new story. They say you can write your own book of forgiving. That's the book of forgiving isn't the book that they wrote, it's the one that, that we write. After the forgiveness, remember that part was unconditional. The forgiveness itself is not with strings attached, but there's another choice, and that's what happens to the relationship. We can renew it or release it. It's like a step beyond. Now there's actually some actions that might need to happen. It is a choice. Desmond Tutu is clear that he thinks renewal is preferred when possible to be free from victimhood and trauma. And if you can renew, um, you may need to ask for something in order to renew, or you may need to ask for something in order to release. So for example, I'd like to go forward together, but I do need to hear that you are sorry. I do need to hear you acknowledge that you hurt me. I might need an explanation. I might need you to give something back that you stole from me. Or if I'm realizing I can't, I have to release, I need, may need you to stop contacting me. We examine and accept our own part in the conflict. 
And we remember that renewing isn't the same as restoring. So we don't go back to what it was. The relationship has changed, maybe for the better, but it has changed because something happened. We've acknowledged that we've gone forward. We're building a new relationship. When we can't do that, when there's an issue of safety or somebody has died or somehow it's, the, the hurt is not someone that we carry in our heart, it's something that's happened a bit more remotely, um, releasing means we just no longer wish that person or those people ill. They don't take up space in our head or heart and we release the old story. You know, we stop, we just, we stop, we stop. We, it doesn't have the power over us anymore. It doesn't mean we're, we're all buddy-buddy. It just has changed the power dynamic that was going on. And you may not be ready for either renewing or releasing, even after you've forgiven, you may not know even this piece. You don't have to have all the answers to what you would do before you get there. If we need forgiveness, we walk the same path. Whether we've hurt someone intentionally or unintentionally, whether the harm is perceived and we think, well, it didn't really, it's, it's a harm is a harm is a harm. So we still walk the path. Some, in some ways, in reverse, when we need to ask for forgiveness, we recognize the mutual harm. We might need to gather the support so we have the strength to do it. We tell the story, admitting the wrong. We are willing to witness the hurt, allow ourselves to hear the anguish in the other person without correcting them or justifying our action or you know, kind of papering it over. We answer questions honestly and fully. We say, I'm sorry. And we actually ask for forgiveness, actually ask to be unhooked from the past. And then when the person chooses, if they even choose to forgive us, and they may not, if they choose to renew or release the relationship, we honor it. And the same kind of thing is true then. Then it doesn't take up space in our head anymore. We've done what we can. We've now let it go. When it's ourselves that we have to forgive, it's really hard. But there's even a way to walk this forgiveness journey to ourselves. Um, we're not less forgivable than anyone else. If we think we are, we may have a little bit of arrogance in there, thinking that we are held to a different standard, right? We have guilt, which is when we feel bad, and there may be actions we need to take to make amends. When we carry shame, that's a sense that I am bad, and that moves us to isolation. But guilt and taking action moves us towards connection. Our worth doesn't come from what we've done or not done. We accept ourselves as flawed, and we face the truth of who we are. And he said, a world of forgiveness is possible to us when we practice this. Again, in small things, so when the big things happen, we're ready for that too. When I cultivate forgiveness in my small everyday encounters, I'm preparing for the time when a much larger act of forgiveness will be asked of me, which it almost certainly will. They explore a little bit. The next question they explore, they, they say that each, each kind of family, city, country, town, country, the world, needs to ask questions around justice. What is the hope outcome? What, are we looking at retrib retributive justice? Are we looking at restorative justice? So they, they explore that just a little bit. Without forgiveness to break the cycle of injury and violence, we set the scene for family feuds that last generations. Without forgiveness, we create patterns of violence and hurt that get recreated in neighborhoods and cities and between countries for decades or even centuries. We can't create a world without pain or loss or conflict or hurt feelings, but we can create a world of forgiveness. We can create a world of forgiveness that allows us to heal from those losses and pain and therefore heal our relationships. So opportunities to ponder and to practice. I think worship is a huge one. When we come to worship, we bring our whole selves to God with others. There's a real vulnerability in that. And we can notice and name the hurts to God, the failings. When we hear the prayers of others, we can take in that compassion. So being with God in worship actually I think is a way that we can practice forgiveness. We have a Lenten quiet day coming up. I'm going to be using the book to actually have, be more of a personal experience. No one will have to share anything that they don't want to share. It won't be one of those, let's all go around the room, but there'll be some time to speak together and time for personal work, and I'll be available um, to listen. 
Our Lenten series is getting into sin and what's wrong with us and what God can help us do about it. So um, the evil that enslaves us, the evil we have done, the evil done on our behalf, cosmic and systemic and personal sin. So that'll be one of those times when we're telling those honest stories about what our world and what we are really like and how God is part of freeing us as we walk this way. Your general confession in worship, but also the rite of reconciliation that you can do with a clergy person when you bring that story and that impact, and then we release it together to God. That is a sacramental rite that might help you if you're feeling especially stuck. And then we have a pilgrimage coming up in October where we'll be practicing the habits of a reconciler, going to three different centers in the UK, Cormila, Iona, and Rose Castle to do some work in community of telling stories and naming and practicing the work of forgiveness and reconciliation.